This is part of the Great Gobi Desert in northwestern China. Almost 2,000 years ago, imperial outposts were erected here on this corridor that opened ancient China to what was then the Wild West. Travellers would rest here as they plied the historic Silk Road. Through this way, Buddhism also entered the Middle Kingdom. One such outpost should have been buried by the sands over time. Yet it still stands today because of the unrelenting efforts of its people. CNA correspondent tells the stories of the heroes making sure life remains sustainable for us on this planet. This is Minxian, a county in the middle of China's largest deserts. It sits at the southern edge of the Great Gobi Desert, one of four major sources of sand and dust storms in China. From the map, Mintian is like a wedge, separating two different deserts. The Tengar on the right and the Badain Jaran on the left. So you could see how its survival could be under threat if the two deserts expand and combine into one Mintian could be completely wiped out. For over two millennia, people have been living in this area which began as a key trade and defence outpost for Imperial China. For generations, villages clustered around this oasis thanks to a river that flows through the desert, supplying water for 180,000 people making a living from the arid land here. Huang has been a farmer his entire life. He remembers a time when he grew crops like mustard and cabbage. But these days, he turns to less water-intensive crops like corn. As usage rose, groundwater in Mintian declined. Huang showed me the well where his water comes from. There used to be water five meters down, but by 2005, it had plunged below 20 meters. The year before, the only reservoir in Mintian emptied to the ground. It was a critical point. Researchers warned that if things don't change, Mintian could turn bone dry by next year, 2022. In 2006, the government began rationing water. It sealed thousands of private wells. We're at the edge of Mr. Ma's village and you can see that the desert has expanded right to their doorstep. And if they don't prevent the desert from expanding, it could swallow up their entire village. Facing the loss of his home, another Minxian native decided to come home from Yunnan, where he had been working as a salesperson for a medical company. In 
呃自然环境呢变化的比较快，所以就从外面回来，然后开始想办法来治理沙漠，阻挡这个沙漠的前进，来保护家园。Mr. Ma publicized the plight of his disappearing home on social media. The call for help grew into a movement. In 2006, he formed the Save the People Volunteer Association, inviting volunteers from all across the country to help plant sexual trees in the desert during the summer and autumn season. In the early attempts, the sexual trees never survived. Its tiny seedlings were lifted from the sand whenever the wind blows. The sand here is very loose and gets blown away easily. This sand dune is moving at a speed of about 10 meters a year and crouching into the villages and farmland nearby. But if you come over here where they've planted sex all in the ground, it stabilizes the sand, which is much harder and more compact. And that's why you see a depression in the land here with a line of vegetation ends, because this part of the sand dune is moving much faster than this side. After some trial and error, they came up with the idea of making straw lattices. Mm. Fifteen years of tree planting paid off. By the end of last year, forest coverage rate increased six times from an initial 3% in the 1950s to 18%. Officials plan to have the shrubs form a belt more than 400 kilometers long, a great green wall to keep the desert at bay. This researcher has been studying how to battle the desert for 16 years now. His team built this 50 meters tower here to measure the speed of wind and sand movement. He tells me that Mintin's afforestation has reduced the frequency of sandstorms five-fold, from about 15 times a year in the 90s to just three times a year now. Mintin Rizhou, he is an important part of the forest forest. The forest forest is able to reduce the forest forest and reduce the forest forest. Almost on cue as well, after running empty for months, water began reappearing in the rivers of Mintian again. Thanks not just to afforestation, but also to an ambitious water diversion project. This is the only source of water for the entire Mintian County. But the problem is there is so little rainfall here and the evaporation rate is more than 20 times that of the precipitation rate. And so this river became bone dry in 2004. The reason why there is a color difference there is because the yellow water is coming from the Yellow River some 200 kilometers away. And this bluish green water is coming from a reservoir from a neighboring county. These water transfer projects are now the lifeline for the 180,000 people living here in Mintian. That water went into Mintian's own dried up reservoir. Local government began dredging it after it dried up, increasing its capacity by 50%. Now it's the jewel of Mintian, the largest desert reservoir in Asia and a tourist attraction to boot. In the winter months, migratory birds like swans and bar-headed geese stop over the desert wetlands. Fungshola, 
对我觉得人生四十年这个最大的成就。Make sure Min Tian doesn't become the next Lop Nor. Lop Nor is an oasis in Xinjiang that dried up and disappeared in the 1970s, and this is now the rallying cry of residents here. Unlike in Lop Nor, generations more will continue to be able to live here. As Min Tian finds a way to coexist alongside nature's most destructive forces. By co-opting nature itself. What goes down the toilet tends to become out of sight and out of mind. But some South Koreans are giving it a second life. The usefulness of poo when CNA correspondent returns. Recreational class for residents of Wanchang Village in the southern province of Chinchengdu. Programs like this are provided by the government in provincial areas for an aging population. And it's the job of the village head Song Yong Su to organize various programs like this and other projects to help make the community a better place to live. Recently, Song's task has been to gather support for the construction of a biogas plant that converts pig manure into energy. Idle for this village, which has the most number of pig farms in the country, but inconvenient too, as waste from various pig farms would be collected and brought to this one area. But the community, he says, will benefit as the future plan is to grow tropical crops in a glass greenhouse facility with excess heat generated from the treatment of the waste. Most of them have agreed to the plan, but some remain unhappy, like this grandmother who has been living in this village for 55 years. Other residents were sympathetic, but felt it was one process they had to endure for a better future. 애들 분뇨가 사실 뭐 이제 숙성을 시켜서 자체 농장에다 숙성을 시켜서 밭으로 가든 아니면 장사꾼한테 파, 팔든 그렇게 이제 내부로 나갔었는데 지금은 저런 시설은 모아지는 거잖아요. 근데 보면은 저런 시설이 사실 필요는 해요. 소, 짐승의 동물의 가축 이런 오줌 똥은 어쨌든 나오기 마련이잖아요. 그러니까 의미는 되게 좋은 거예요. The poo factory that the grandmother is referring to is run by a resident here, Ido Hon, who is also known as D H Lee. He moved here from the capital Seoul about eight years ago with a plan for this plant that captures methane gas naturally emitted from pig manure and converts it into electricity. But I could soon tell why the grandmother was very upset. There is a nasty smell here. D.H. Lee explains how whether or not you get a whiff is a bit like striking a lottery. Depending on the wind direction, it can hit you real hard or simply pass. He knew nothing about pig farms or farming before he came here. He used to work for more than 15 years as a financial engineer, applying engineering techniques to finance problems, traveling around the world from various cities in Southeast Asia, including Singapore to the United States. But he was tired and wanted to retire. So he made an investment in 2011. I thought that investment in pig farm will give me stable long-term return. So I was so I made some stakeholding minority stake in the pig farm here, but my investment was a big failure. <laughs> in 2013, the pig farm almost went bankrupt. All the other stakeholders wanted out. 
Feeling ashamed and humiliated for his failure, he took over the farm, determined to save it. Since then, he says, it's been like a roller coaster ride. But thanks to the support of the villagers, he successfully got the system built and running. He took me around, telling me how manure collected from swine farms are brought to this one area four to five times a day by trucks like this. It is then stored in an underground storage, making its way to these tanks. So every day we pump in 100 or 110 manure. So it will stay in three tanks for 52 days. Then it will be fermented. Using a torchlight, I looked in. There are bubbles and you can see them popping also. Right. So that is where I guess. Yes. Wow. Well, that's amazing. It was difficult to catch it on camera, but the principle behind it is a simple one. When we make wine, we, can, we put fruits or the rice, which is organic matter. Then we close the bottle, that's and then true. the bacteria works and turn it into alcohol. And the same process applied here. But in this case, instead of alcohol, we produce methane gas. Currently, he produces enough energy to run this plant. But his aim is to produce more electricity so that with the swine manure collected from the thousands of pigs in the farms in this village and around here, his plant will produce enough electricity for the whole of Wonchan village. Because under South Korean regulations, the state-run Korea Electric Power Corp, KEPCO, has monopoly over domestic power distribution. Using a microgrid system, it would revolutionize energy in South Korea. Kim Sung Soo, director of the new and renewable fusion program at the Korea Institute of Energy Technology, is optimistic about its future, saying diversifying sources is the direction that the government is heading for since the country imports most of its energy. He says projects like this could help solve the problem of how most residents are against the idea of having plants like this because of a fear of radiation. In the winter, if we, the greenhouse has a free heat, it can produce some mango, for example then cost of energy will virtually go zero. So the village will make a profit. They will maximize their competitive advantage, which is free energy. And then those fruit or whatever crop uh, will be carbon free because we are not using uh, any energy outside. If pig poo can fly as an energy source, can human poo? Well, it can, and it already has. Find out how when CNA Correspondent returns. It's not just animal manure that can produce energy, so can human waste. Using this toilet, the poo that is flushed down is produced into biogas. Yeah, this is a BV toilet, only one model in the world because we made it by hand. So we're proud of this one, distinct from other uh, flushing toilets. We use a very small amount of water to flush that out. We only use one liter instead of uh, 15 or 13 liter. Everything goes into the basement storage tanks. He then led me to an area where the human waste is stored. It doesn't smell. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't smell in yeah, here. That's why. So we would like to convince the, the people to use these types of it, even inside apartment. Right. If we eat the food, we digest to make energy into our cell. Exactly the same inside this bioreactor. So they use uh, uh, the poo as their food to make their energy, to make their cell as well. So and the byproduct of those fermentation process is bioenergy, such as methane.
He says it can turn about one pound of human waste, an average amount of human poos every day, into about 50 liters of methane gas. That would generate about half a kilowatt hour of electricity, enough to drive an electric car for about 1.2 kilometers. The poo could also serve as a circular, self-sustaining energy cycle within the home. And then use in our uh, range in the kitchen and the boiler as well to make our warm water. To get the project started in the beginning, he needed students to donate their poo. And so he came out with an idea. So I proposed a uh, currency. If you donate your poo, I can give you money. So uh, then they start to be interested in that. That is virtual currency called gul or honey in Korean. Soon students were walking in this toilet like Pokdan, a Romanian student at this campus. Since using this toilet would provide them with 10 units of gul every day. Hi. Just want to ask you a few questions because you just came out of it. Usually I need to try to come here every day. <laughs> I come here in order to get gul. And with that, he is able to purchase things like drinks from vending machines or books from this corner where students barter goods using gul. Students used to also trade their poo for one cup of freshly brewed coffee. The gold concept is really interesting because it's a currency based on an actual human value. So the human value is exactly this, what I used, the feces. So it's not an abstract currency based on some kind of abstract power. It's based on human value with, a, with an energy based on feces. As we have seen, poo is not a taboo subject here in South Korea. Not too far away, children can learn more about poo. This poo poo land in the southern coast city of Busan features various obstacle courses, going through small and large intestines to explain how food is digested in the body before it ends up like this. 국내 최초로 똥이라는 소재로 이제 테마크를 형성을 했는데요. 다양한 착취 작품과 어린이들에게 똥으로 다가가는 게 단순 더러운 내용이 아니라 어떻게 사람의 음식물이 변하는 가능 과정들을 체험으로 풀이를 하기 위해서. In fact, there's a belief in South Korea that if a person dreams of poo, he or she will become prosperous, and that could be true. Poo, whether from animals or human, could become a lucrative commodity to put communities, schools, and eventually the country onto a more sustainable way of living. <laughs>